and welcome to the final edition in the current off-track lockdown series. This evening, I'm going to be chatting to two times Formula One world champion, Rob Speak. Rob, thank you so much for doing this today. I know you're incredibly busy at the stadium, despite no racing at the moment, so I do appreciate the time you've taken out for doing this. No problem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Right, so you've been incredibly successful in both Formula 2 and Formula 1, but I guess it's the one victory in either formula that, looking back, kind of really stands out, as we're sitting here today going, that's the one that really stands out for me. There's so many, you know, it's hard to pick a thing, you know, in, in different formulas, different settings, it's, you know, I've been successful in everything, but um, Ennisford World Final, probably, that's that was, you know, winning the Formula 1 World Final for the first time was good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. We'll come to that. I'll, we'll come to that in a bit. We'll, we'll come back to that. So you can tell me why in a bit. All right. So keep that. Keep thinking about that one. Um, so talking about coming into Formula One first, right? So there were two periods in Formula One. So if we go back to the first one, which started in 1999, you, you came into the sport with a bit of a bang. Now, I know you said you've not seen any, any of these interviews, but I have talked about an incredible period in the sport when there was you, Frank Herman Jr. and Andy Smith, and there was just that period of time. And it was, it was just yeah. brilliant. Um, so when you came into Formula One, was it with the intention of taking on Frank Freeman Jr. or did it just kind of happen? Well, it was, it was different. We, you know, when we raced our minis, we was clashing when we raced the mini stocks together. Then Frankie Wehmer went F1s, I went to Formula 2s. It sort of, we broke away for a while. And then the rivalry is always there. He's top of his job. I was top of my job. We got back together and it had to kick off, didn't it? It, it, it certainly did. It certainly did. And, 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 and like I say, did it just like happen then because you were both in the same form at the same time and you were both wanting to be top dog, if you like? Yeah, that's right. You know, it was all sort of similar age. Me, Andy, Frank, we were all sort of at the top of our game, even though it was in, you know, a different thing. I come into it and I, you know, I wanted to join them straight away. You know, there was no point in trying to settle in. I just went in, sort of attacking and, and sort of get my way to the top. Brilliant. And and there was that, um, I guess one of the most famous clashes came at Wimbledon in October 2001. Um, there's loads of pictures, of, you know, out there that, about that. What's your recollection of that meeting? Because it was kind of, it was a huge talking point in the sport at the time. Yeah, that's right. There wasn't, uh, it was just one of them meetings. It was a bit quiet. There weren't many cars. It sort of just escalated into what it ended up. It was, uh, it was very good. I enjoyed it. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> so that, that looking back, do you kind of go, that, that was quite brutal what, what me and Frank did at that stock car meeting? Did you have that thought? No, I just think more meetings should have been like that. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Brilliant. So um, obviously you said you were you were rivals with, with Frankie on track. I, I'm guessing you weren't great friends off track. Would that be fair to say? Uh not really, no. I think we both had a lot of respect for each other and, you know, we would have never, you know, we, we were in, always civil with each other and I thought we got on all right, really, off the track. It, when you're on the track, it's a different thing to being off the track. Okay. So would you say you're a different person on track than off track then? You know, you meet Ross speak on track, you're very different to the guy that you talk to off track, would you say? 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, right. So you mentioned um, right at the very beginning. I said that kind of you know standout moment, and you said the two thousand and one World Final at Hednesford. So when yeah. you won that, you became one of only two drivers to win uh, the Gold Roof in Formula One and Formula Two. So do you think that was a pivotal moment in your Formula One career? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's to achieve world champion in both formulas. It's it's a big thing for for you know, for a brisker driver and. Um, yeah, you know, and I think I was racing with sort of our generation, the best of what could have been. So, you know, it wasn't easy. It was, uh, it was I don't know, but it, I, for me, it was really good, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, you've got your name in the, the, the history books, if you like. Is yeah. that something you kind of be really proud of? Actually, I, I did that and, you know, something to look back on with fondness, if you like. Yeah, that's right. You know, there's only me and Dave Chisholm ever done it. So, you know, it's, it is a, it's a good thing to have on your CV, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. When you go for a job interview for a stock car driver, you can say, look, I did We that. never know, do you? <laughs> Brilliant. So um, we've talked about, um, you know, your rival with Frank Raymond Jr. And you've, and you've talked a little bit about that. And I'll be honest, I don't particularly um, follow Formula 2 so much. 
Um, but the kind of, I guess the standout for me is the rivalry you've had with uh, Gordon Mooney when he when he came back into the sport in that that period of time between the two Formula One stints. So wh- where did that rivalry come from? I guess, and obviously you're going to do a bit of Formula Two uh, next year or this year. Is, is that rivalry still there? Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> I, would, I would presume so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, I just come into the into the sport. He was the top man at the time, and if you're going to come in, you might as well start on the top man, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You must have this thing. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to set your mark, you might as well set it high. <laughs> and, and I guess did you did you enjoy racing against Gordon? I mean, was it obviously you know he's, he was the top man in the sport at the time when you came back into football. So did you see it as a challenge to kind of take him on? I did see it as a challenge, but formal tunes had changed so much from when I left to when I came back. There was completely a different thing. And if I'm honest with you, I can't say I really enjoyed the racing when I come back. It was too fast, too precise, too, like, hot roddy, if you like. So I just mixed it up a little bit. Yeah, OK. Because people say that about Formula 2, especially on tarmac, isn't it? It's become quite, like, how you described, with sort of a little bit of that, not as much action and stuff. Is don't know. Hopefully you can get back to being how it was when you first were in it, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. I think they've got far too much grip for the power they've got. And, um, you know, it's hard. With stock car racing, you've got to slow down for the corners, haven't you? They, which gives somebody a chance to run in and run in the back of somebody. And with Formula 2s, that's sort of gone away a little bit. So, I don't know. Just, just try a bit yeah. hard. Yeah, absolutely. I can remember when I was talking to Mick Sawyer ages ago, and he was. I asked him about the difference between... Uh, Formula One and Formula Two, and he, and he was saying that in Formula Two you can pretty much keep it on all the way around, and and that's it. Whereas Formula One, you're having to stop and start to, yes. to slow it down for corners. That's right. You know, the, it's all about momentum in a Formula Two. In a Formula One, you've got that much horsepower. It's about getting it down as quick as you can, but stopping the thing to get around the corner. So you yeah. know, you do get a chance to, you know, you do get a chance for them last bend dives. You do get a chance to run it, you know, hit something moving wide. With Formula 2, it's more difficult because of the momentum. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you for that. So um, we did Formula 1s in, at the beginning, then we did form, back into Formula 2s, and you came back into Formula 1 sort of 10 years later. Um, how, how much it changed in the sport in Formula 1 during that period of time you were away, and was it really difficult to get back into it again? Uh, not really. I don't think it had changed that much. The, the, the things had started looking a lot prettier. Um, the drivers look more like they come out of a boy band as opposed to big, grufty, you know, men. <laughs> Maybe that's because I was getting older. But, um, yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't much difference. No, I, I sort of fell back straight into it. OK. Because yeah. I spoke to uh, interview Stuart Smith Jr. Uh, last week and we were talking about um, when he had a bit of time off in, in Formula 1, um, so in the late 2000s, and he, early 2000s, sorry. And he was saying it's quite difficult when he came back at that year out. Everything, things seem to move on quite a lot. So I was kind of interested in your perspective because it's such a long period out. Yeah, I think we're going back into Formula 2s and the change had been massive from when I left Formula 2s to when I came back to Formula 2s that I didn't really notice much of a difference in Formula 1s. Yeah, OK. And, so, and when he came back the sort of second time, um, it was done very much with the support of Jamie Davidson, you know, wearing his T-shirt today, which is, which, is, which, is, which is good, good sponsorship, I like that. Um, yeah. So how did that arrangement come about? Well, Jamie Davidson sponsored me the first time round as well. It was okay. Jamie Davidson's car I won the world final in Ennisford. So yeah. Jamie's always been part of my Formula One, you know, career. Yeah. yeah. And so was he the one that kind of said, right, you need to come back in Formula One, or was it a bit of both, or...? Pretty much. I went to Holland and raced the Formula 2 at the World Cup for Willie Peters. And on the way back with Jamie Davidson, they, from leaving the track to getting home, they taught me into racing Formula 1. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just <laughs> spectacular. Okay. So, so how, how, was, was it a long conversation? Was it kind of like, we like, no, no, I'm not doing it. And then eventually they, they convinced you. It was about six hours of a conversation from you know, <laughs> leaving the track in Holland to getting home. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, they convinced me anyway. I was only doing a few meetings, a couple of qualifiers, only tarmac, and before you know where you are, I had a shell car and doing every meeting. Yeah, we were, were you pleased that it <clears throat> that it did change though? Because obviously you kind of said, right, I'm going to do a few meetings. Yeah, fine, you've convinced me. Yeah, and obviously it, it changed. Were you pleased it actually did change? So you were kind of doing shell tarmac, or were you actually? Uh, it was a uh, yeah, it was. I, obviously, I enjoyed it because I did it. Um, yeah. 
it's just very difficult, isn't it? You think you're only going to do a few meetings. It's like a drug. Stock car racing is like a drug. Stay away from it. You don't miss it. Soon as you watch it once, you're back into it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So um, you've talked about the differences between Formula 2 and Formula 1, obviously racing both. Did, did you have to adapt your driving style significantly between the two formulas? Uh, yeah, a little bit. With Formula 2, like I say, it's all about momentum and not much power. So it's about carrying the speed where you can. And with Formula 2, uh, with Formula 1, it's all about power and slowing the thing down. So I found it pretty difficult on some days. Like Bellevue's when I used to race them both um, was a little bit difficult, you know. But it was a good challenge for me, you know, to, to sharpen your driving, you know, style up. Yeah, because some people are liking to ride on a bike. Into you're in a stock car and you know what you're doing and you just kind of get on with it. Then obviously your brain wants to do something different because it's I'm in a stock car and well, which one? So yeah, yeah. you go you go from a lot of horsepower to not very much horsepower, and it's a big difference in like getting with 20 minutes between a race. You know, you just jump out of one straight into another. But I, I did enjoy it. You know, we did try. What I, what I wanted to do was try and win a final in both of them on the same day. I never did. I won an eater. I won a Grand National on the same day in both cars, but I never got around to winning the final. Right. Nearly, though. Nearly, which is good. <laughs> you know, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to try, haven't you? Yeah, um, so when he came back into Formula 1 for the second time, obviously the rivalry with Frank Raymond Jr. continued, but there were lots of new drivers at, at the top of the sport. Did, did you find it harder the second time around? Um, I don't know, really. I... I the, f the second time round, I had a lot of respect in Taft drivers, which was younger drivers. You know, it was the difference. When I first come in, I had no respect of anybody. It was just a Formula 2 lad coming into Formula 1s and we won't give him any room. Whereas when I come back into Formula 2s, the respect was already there. So it was, I'd say it was easier the second time in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, what, and obviously you were racing like Dan Johnson, that kind of ilk were there yeah. in the sport. Right? So you, it wasn't just Frankie and Andy, I'd say, when you had a lot more younger no. drivers. That's right. You've got to, you know, to learn the new drivers and see how it is and, you know, the the different generation of driving style. You've got to get used to that, haven't you? But my driving style has always been the same. You know, find a bit of trouble and go for it. <laughs> I'll come to that in a minute. I want to come to, I've got that down. I've, <laughs> I've already identified that, Rob, so it's good. Um, so it was a successful stint during that second period of, of Formula One. Uh, you won the world and you won the silver twice. And um, which one of those gave you the, the most satisfaction, I guess? Winning the world finals, massive. You know, that big crowd, the big atmosphere. It's, it really is. You can't, ex you know, you can't explain it, really. Um, but winning the silver roof was just as good because it's over a longer period of time. It's not just one race, is it? You know, so you've got to, got to keep chipping away, chipping away at the points. And both times it's come pretty close with me. You know, it's come to the last meeting, which is good. Yeah, we obviously spoke to Nigel Green. Uh, I didn't interview Nigel Green. We spoke about the, the, Bell, the Bellevue uh, to meet. What was, what was your kind of recollection of that one? I thought it was really good. Nigel did what he had to do, and I thought it was brilliant. You know, I'd have been disappointed if he hadn't have done that, which was a yeah. good thing. You know, as I knew, as he was coming in, I aimed for the back of rubber. Then rubber would get most of the damage, and I could hopefully back off, and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> were, you, were you green underneath your helmet when when oh, you saw yeah. him? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so in terms of um, sort of the World Championship, you've, you've mentioned that. Do, do you see that as, as the title as opposed to the silver roof? Is that kind of the one that you hold in the highest regards in either formula? Yeah, I think it is because when you win the World Championship, it's a massive audience on the on the day, isn't it? Whereas when you win the silver roof, some people come to some rounds, some people don't always go to the last round. The crowd, the atmosphere isn't the same, but winning the world final, when you go out for that rolling lap and the build up and everything, it's it makes you feel pretty special. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the occasion, isn't it? And it you, is you are occasion. absolutely. And if you don't mind me asking around the, the shootout, do you like that as a format in terms of the Formula One piece? I like it as a as a as a format, yeah, because to do it over all the season, not everyone can afford that, can they? But if they can get into the shootout, then you start at zero and away you go. You know, you only got to do them 12 rounds, which I think is is really good. Yeah. And did you have a view on the Formula 2 ones? Obviously, they do it kind of different, don't they, to Formula 1, yeah. which is to try and make that work a little bit better, don't they? Because obviously the drivers are here, there and everywhere, aren't they? They're That's the not... problem is the driver base. It, the, there's so many drivers, they're so far spread, it's difficult to sort of organise it. But when I won the 
you know, the Formula 2 national points for so long. I never missed a meeting. Some you know, years I'd do 90-plus meetings, and the, my nearest person might have only done 60. So it's a pretty unfair way of doing it. It was just, for me, I could do every meeting. It was pretty easy. I, I treated it like a job. Yeah. Did, did you enjoy? Sorry, I, yeah, did you enjoy doing that in Formula Two? Did you enjoy kind of that that many meetings over a year? Yeah, I did. You know, and it was just like it was just like a job. I worked as well in the scrapyard, but it was just part of the life. That's how I've been brought up. It was just go racing, work, go racing, work, and you know that's just the way it was. And that I, I did enjoy it. Yeah, I wouldn't change it for anything. You must be exhausted. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's good fun, isn't it? You meet a lot of people. You're all over the country. It's good fun. Okay, brilliant. Um, so you retired from Formula One in 2017. Um, what prompted that decision that actually I'm now done with Formula One stock cars? Um, I think I just, I'd just sort of had enough, really. You know, and Skegness had come up for sale, you know, the year before, and we'd been interested in that with Azul, and so I bought that. So that really put the final nail in the coffin. But I, I was getting to be. You know, I think I'm getting a bit old for stock cars, really, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. yeah. Is it just that the knocks and the things take a bit longer to... Not so much yeah. that, but you've got to, at some point, you've got to start earning a bit, you? you can't just keep going racing. You know, that's how I... That's it. Yeah. OK. Um, <clears throat> so, I guess, just putting stock cars to one side for a second, like, similar to a few other drivers, you did some racing on circuits in Ascot. Um, yeah. I, I guess, A, did you enjoy it, and B... And perhaps more important, do you want to do more of that? No, I don't want to do any more of it. Um, I would have liked to have done a little bit more at Rockingham at that time, but it was um, it was quite a difficult time for me at the time, you know, I wasn't with racing, so it was difficult to do the Formula 1 and the Ascar, but I really enjoyed the Ascar. I wish I'd have been doing it a little bit earlier or a little bit later, because at that time it was a bit of a difficult period for me. It just work wasn't right, everything else wasn't right, and it was just, I felt like I could have done better if it had been at a, a bit earlier or a bit later. Yeah, so a, a bit of a missed opportunity potentially for yourself. Back. Probably, but there's never a missed opportunity, is there? If you long to take every opportunity, what's there? It's never missed, is it? No, no. Okay, lovely. Right, so here, I'm going to put you on the spot with this one. So we've got you, because we've been speaking about these people already. So you, Frank Raymond Jr. and Gordon Moody in an identical race car. So let's say a stops car. You can have a race. So what's your top three? How's it going to finish? I wouldn't have thought any of us would finish. Really? <laughs> <laughs> the way I would see it, Bonnie, now. <laughs> So it's, it could be a good, a, you know, back racing, talk to Reenigans. It, it could be a, a great, a great event. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> that's the way I would see it finishing. None of us. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, is there any driver from another formula that you would like to see race a Formula One stock car full time? Uh, the obvious bit would be God and Moody. You know, I yeah. would like to. You know. He, see him have a different challenge, you know, dominating Formula 2 for such a longer period as he has. I'd like to see him, you know, to do that, but it's very difficult from his location. You know, yeah. that's I think that's the biggest problem, living in Scotland, to race a Formula 1, which is mainly the north of England. I think he'd, he'd struggle, but uh, that's what I would like to see, yeah. Uh, so, you know, when you said you came into Formula 1 and you talked about the, the respect piece the first time around, do you think Gordon would bring, I guess, a bit of respect with him because of what he's done in Formula 2 and, and stuff, and everybody's quite sort of knows of him, I guess. Well, they all knew of me, but I think it's difficult. I think when he, I think if he comes in, nobody would want him coming from one formula into the other one and doing as well. So I think you've got to earn your respect. I think I don't think they would just give it you. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Absolutely, it makes sense. So going back to the tracks, you, 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 you did 90 meetings in your Formula 2, you raced at loads and loads of tracks. So of all the tracks you've raced at, which one was your favourite and why? <clears throat> Cowden Beat. Yeah, probably Cowden Beats. Yeah, just... Why? Why? Cowden Beats with Formula 2, probably Ennisford with Formula 1. Ah, OK. Yeah. Uh, Cowden Beats with the Formula 2, nobody liked me, which was brilliant. It, you know, it was giving me a good challenge to, to go and beat them. That's what I, you know, that's why I went, because they didn't want me to go. That, that gives me an, another incentive to go. And um, and Ennisford, I just like the track and the speed of a Formula 1 run there. I think it's awesome. Okay, so I, I do remember reading, uh, you know, about you going into Cat and Beath, you know, in your Formula Two, and obviously the crowd weren't particularly keen on you. So, was it a proper atmosphere when you're out there and you were winning and stuff? Is that what kind of spurred you off? Yeah, it, it, 
Yeah, well, you, sometimes I pushed it a little bit too far. You knew when they were throwing bottles at you and they still had beer in them, you knew you'd upset them, really. Yeah. But um, I think the worst time was when I had to have a police escort out of there. But, uh, really? yeah, but they were that passionate. You know, I, I wouldn't have changed it for anything. It was brilliant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds quite scary, to be fair. <laughs> oh, no, not really. <laughs> Do, do you think? Do you think? Obviously, you know, you know, you've been at Canterbury's, and then you know, you've got that old, you've got a drama about it, haven't you? You've got that whole kind of thing going on. Do, do you think we need a bit more of that in stock Not necessarily people lobbing bottles at you, but no. do you think we need a drama like that? I think there needs to be more rivalries, more feuds, and less less personal. You know, I think that's that's the problem. There's a bit of a bit of niggle now, and it becomes personal. Um, yeah. And it needs to be less personal. Me and Frank never took it personal. You know, if, if we was going racing, I saw Frank, you know, broke down, would have stopped. You know, he would have stopped for me. It was never personal. It's just on the track, and that's how it needs to stay. Yeah, no, absolutely. It does. Absolutely does. And I, th and I think the sport does benefit from having those rivalries, absolutely, as, as we've seen, as history shows, as it does. <clears throat> so, we've got to finally retire, and the reasons as to why. Um, so, and you mentioned Skegness already. So, how and why did come about that you decided, I'm going to buy Skegness and become a promoter? What, what was the decision process, I guess, behind that? Skegness just come up for sale. Tracks never, you know, they very rarely come up for sale. And it was up for sale. We knew about it, went and seen Hazel and uh, managed to strike a deal with Hazel. And it was, uh, it was just a good way of staying involved with a sport that you know I love, my family loves, and uh, you know giving giving back something to stock car racing. Is is that how you see it? Is that how you see the, what, you, what you're doing? I see it. Yeah, you know we're just looking after the track till somebody else takes it over. But you want I I personally want stock car racing to be around forever, and that's yeah. the only reason we you know I've got the track and that I'm doing what I'm doing to it. Okay, brilliant. Um, so I guess Skegness is quite different to most of the other tracks we race at in that you have almost two clientele. You've got the overall track fan that goes and watches stock cars and you've got the holiday maker that comes looking for an evening's entertainment. Is there anything that you've learned from catering for the latter that you think would benefit brisker Formula 1 stock cars? Uh, it's, it's difficult. They're two completely different people. I think the holiday makers watching the stock cars wouldn't get it. You know, for one, I think that is the biggest problem. They come to watch the monster truck, crush a few cars, and the racing is just a gap filler in between. Or they come to watch the motorbike stunt show. I, I think it's difficult, but we do need to be, you know, pushing Formula 1s, pushing stock car racing in general, not just Formula 1s, um, in front of a different audience, I think. Yeah, because they used to do, Formula 1 used to go and do that uh, midweek meeting, didn't they, a, a while ago, and to get, get them in front of holiday crowds. They did, but when I took it over, Hazel advised me not to do that because she said it wasn't sort of the holiday makers didn't get Formula Ones. It was something uh, me and my wife have talked about, and we want to try and do it again, but the timing just hasn't been right up to now. Yeah, okay. Um, I think you've already sort of mentioned this, but I'll, just, I'll kind of just reference it again. You know, you, did you buy Signus because it, it came available? Were there other tracks you were looking at that you were quite interested in, or just because actually that's the one that's there to buy? No, that was the one that came up to buy. You know, there's very little stock car tracks that actually do come up for sale. So it was uh, it was for sale. It was on the market, and uh, we managed to get a deal with Azo. It's a long way from your house, though, isn't it? <laughs> Not now. I only live I only live five miles away. Oh, have you moved now? Have you? <laughs> I, I had to move. It was it was too difficult. I tried. Well, I did it for two years running it from Manchester, and it was just too difficult. So yeah. we decided to relocate, and I've still got the place in. Manchester with a scrapyard, but it's easy to run Skegness Raceway from here. Yeah, of course, of course. I was thinking that's a long journey every day to work, isn't it, and back again. It's just... It is a very hard work. Yeah, good. Okay, so um, what's the one thing you've encountered as a promoter that you'd never even thought about beforehand? The amount of effort that and time that it takes. I just... You know, when we bought it, we were very naive to how it run. You think you open the gates, go racing and go home again. But uh, the stuff you have to do behind the scenes, the meetings you have to go to and the fixture of planning and all that sort of stuff, which you don't you don't see because the promoters don't let you see it. And I think yeah. if I saw that now, I wouldn't have been as critical against promoters. OK. Yeah. So has it really opened your eyes to kind of the other side, if you like, then, I guess? Massively, massively. But the promoters, I don't know it. It's very, I suppose it's hard to show the drivers what you do, but um, from a driver's perspective, you don't understand what the promoters do till you actually get involved with it. Yeah, 
Okay. I did anyway. It was uh, it opened my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, okay, have you kind of got your head around it now? And actually, it's almost become we know what we're doing. Or are you still kind of learning as you no, go? I'm still kind of learning. It's uh, it's difficult, really. It's I suppose it's hard for me. I don't do the emails. I don't know the computer. I don't know anything. That all falls on Asher. You know, she has to deal with that sort of stuff. So it's uh, a bit more difficult, but we'll get used to it. It, it must have been quite weird walking into that first promoters meeting when you've got all the promoters out there and you're like walking as a new boy. Did you have to introduce yourself? Yeah, they, well, they, they, knew, <laughs> they knew who I was, but it's a different scene to be as a driver with a promoter relationship, as a promoter to promoter relationship. You have yeah, to sort yeah. of get to know these people and, and understand how it works. And uh, we're getting there now. Brilliant. Um, so this weekend, it, it should have been, like I guess, one of your main weekends of the year, the, the UK Open Speed Weekend. Um, so uh, this is relevant. So it's the Saturday night and you've got the three finals on. So you've got Formula One, Formula Two and Saloon. But you can only go and watch one of them. Which one would you choose? For me, it might upset a few Formula One fans, but I'd go and watch Saloons. Would you? I would, yeah, because they're brutal, aren't they? They are. <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I, they're just brutal, and that's the way I like it. You know, they, they're just unbelievable. You know, it just stands the ears up on the back of your neck, and yes, yeah, I like saloons. I always have done. Did you? Have you? Have you have, you've had a bit of a go in them, haven't you? But have you never considered doing them? You're not really doing them sort of full time, if you like, have you? I'm right in saying that answer. Yeah, yeah, I've always wanted a saloon, but we've always been in the wrong location, and my racing's always been too busy. Briskers, yeah. you know, my background and where we've always been. Um, but I've always loved saloons. I've always watched them wherever I've been. And then with having Skegness and living down here, I bought a saloon and I just do Skegnesses and we had a bit of fun. Yeah, good. I think my, my partner, Lisa, when we go to King's Lynn, um, that's the kind of place you tend to see form, uh, Formula 1 and saloons at the same meeting. And, and she likes Formula 1, she's watching, but actually she, she loves watching the saloons. She kind of yeah. thinks they're just a brilliant, you know, because it's easier for it to pick up as well, I suppose. Yeah. That's what I mean. The holiday makers get the saloons because of the crashing and the thing. Form ones, it's a little bit different. They're a bit unique, aren't they? You need to watch them a couple of times before you get used to who they are and what it's about. That's yeah. just the way. I, that's the way I, people have explained it to me, anyway. You know, I get. Yeah, that. we've been brought up with it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I do agree. So, um, what's the best and worst thing about Formula One stock cars? The best and worst thing. Yeah. Oh, the. The feeling of driving them with all that power is the best thing. You know, it, unless you've driven one, it's very hard to explain, but they are an, an awesome thing to drive. The worst thing is they cost too much money and it took me so long to get one. That was the worst thing. I could never afford one. That's so, why pick, a long time. So picking up on that, do you think, do you wish you'd gone into Formula One's a bit earlier then? If we could have, afford, if we wouldn't have gone into Formula Two's, if we could have afforded Formula One at the time, but you know, we, I worked for my dad. My dad didn't have a lot of money, and you know we just didn't have the money to race Formula Ones, so we had to go Formula Two. Yeah, okay, I understand that. Because I have asked a couple of um, like Nigel Green, Mick Sorda, you know, why um, why is it so few people come from Formula Two into Formula One, and, and they've kind of said actually it's probably it's a much bigger operation, and, and the cost is is a bit more to come into Formula One, so that's why people tend to stick at Formula Two. So yeah, that's it, it is a cost issue. That's the the thing. Okay. You, you've mentioned this already. Um, you've been involved in some spectacular incidents over the years. So do you find trouble or does trouble find you? I'd like to say trouble finds me, but that's probably not true. Um, <laughs> I think I definitely find the trouble. If I can't find any, I've caused some. Okay. <laughs> and that's all Did... in the stock car. Not off the, not off the track, that's just in a stock car. Yeah. When I was talking to Stuart last week, I, I asked him around um, sort of the entertainment piece. And I asked him, you know, when you're on track, do you think you're there to entertain or, or to win? And, and his view was it should be like half and half. That half a year you have to win, but equally you've got a duty to entertain for the spectators who have paid to to watch you. Do you, do you have a similar view? Yeah, I think so, definitely. You, you know, it, I think my driving style entertains a few or upsets a few. You know, it's difficult to say, but, you know, my driving style... It's just how the way I drive, you you drive that hard to win, but it entertains people on the way. So yeah. I've never been one to sit back. <laughs> no, not at all. And what's been your funniest moment in stock cars? It, it, there's so many, it's very hard to uh, to say. I don't know. I, 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 there's so many. I, I wouldn't like to say. So I'm sure fans a lot will have a different opinion on them. 
<laughs> okay, I won't push you. I won't push you on that one. It's just a difficult right. question to answer. It's a very difficult question. It is. Um, right, a random question. So, talking about lost property, what's the most random thing that's been left behind after a stock car meeting? A three-piece suite was really? left behind Skegness. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit random, isn't it? It is very random. <laughs> so, when did you find that? The following day, you're walking you're around and you're like... Open, nope, and there's just a nice suite in the corner there where it looks like somebody's brought it just to enjoy the weekend. <laughs> Did you sell it or did you chuck it? No, no, it's in the skip and gone. Along with about 90 tenths, what we find after every speed weekend. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I get that. Um, when you, I mean, you are still racing uh, now, uh, a, a little bit this year in terms of Formula 2, but um, do you have any pre race rituals or superstitions? No, no, nothing at all. I just, just get in it and enjoy it. Yeah, Good the main thing is just enjoying it. Yeah, okay. Have you ever been over to New Zealand to race? I don't think you have. Is that right or wrong? No, I haven't. Um, I would have liked to have done early on in my career, but we really did so many meetings, and then when the sort of meeting stopped in November, I had to just work and work and work to, to make enough funds to, you know, go racing in the March. So that's yeah. just how we, you know, we always did it. We just finished the racing. Stock cars just got turned off, never even got looked at until March. Just work. Yeah. Okay. Because it is uh, when I spoke to a few people, they've said it's such a huge commitment to take like a month out of work to, to yes. go over there and, and, and be, you know it's a huge cost, isn't it? And, and commitment, like you say. So yeah, we could never afford it. I worked with my dad in the family scrapyard, and and that's just the way it was. You know, we, I was fortunate I could go racing all through the year, but when the racing finished, it was back to work. Yeah, to fun if next year makes sense. I'm sorry, makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, I want to keep right. So. The reason why we're doing this, obviously, because of, of, of COVID and coronavirus and stuff. So, you know, it gives us a chance to talk to people like yourself, which is brilliant. Um, so, but to keep, so keeping it topical, um, if you had to choose one current Formula One driver, one formula, former Formula One driver, and a driver from another formula to self-isolate with, so there's just the four of you in one house, who would you choose and why? I, I, don't, I don't know. That's... It's very difficult, you know. It's, you know lots of people. I, I know so many people, and I'm a little bit antisocial, believe it or not. You know, I don't... <laughs> the, minute, the minute the racing finishes, I'm the first out the pits and gone home. You know, I just <laughs> straight back to work. So, I don't know. I'm not... Uh, never really been around in that sort of setting. The most uh, recent is Skegness Speed Weekends, where I've stay, actually stayed in the bar. and never been in a bar before without Skegness. So, oh, okay. no, so... A bit antisocial, really, but... I don't know. Going off uh, Skegness appearance, it's always the last ones in the bar. It'll be like Nigel Green, Paul Harrison, you know, a few saloon drivers, Billy Smith, you know. So there'll be a few like that, I would imagine, but too many to choose. Okay. Well, you could choose some people that are really quiet and you wouldn't have to talk to them. Yeah. They won't see me anyway. I'd probably go and find some work to do. I'm just off working <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Brilliant. People are enjoying lockdown, but I'm just busy. I just find some work to do and get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to choose some people that like drinking then. That we'll do that. We'll, we'll give that as your answer. I'll have that. Yeah. Um, my well, I am tea total. I've never had a drink in my life. Have you not? No, never. Never drank and never smoked. So what? So what happens at the speed weekends when you're in the bar? You just kind of I just stand behind the beer talking to them. They stand behind the bar talking to them. Then they keep buying beer. <laughs> That's, good. <laughs> That's good. Good for business then. <laughs> Right, so you have, like I say, we've been you've been world champion in uh, both formulas. So someone new coming into the sport, what one piece of, adv of advice would you give somebody who wants to be world champion? Do you know, just get stuck in. That's the way to. I find it. You know, it's very hard to find your feet. The way I always approached it was get the bumper in, earn some respect, and just get going. Okay, yeah. it's, a, it's a good it's a good approach. It's served you well. Oh, it served me well, you know, that's that's what stock car racing is. It should just be, you know, the fastest car shouldn't always win. No, no, absolutely not. It's stock car racing, isn't it? That's right. Um, so I'll let you off with the, the self-isolating question, but I'm I'm not good. We're gonna sit here all night until I get this one, right? So your top three Formula One drivers of all time. <clears throat> so difficult. Um 
you know, it's a generational thing, isn't it? You could pick, you know, obviously Stuart Smith, John Lund, you know, Peter Folding. They're all won a lot, done a lot in the sport. But in our generation, it's, you know, we've all, me, Frankie Wehrman, you know, Andrew Smith, young Stuart Smith, we've all done it. Won a lot in our generation, haven't we? So it's it's such a difficult one to answer, but uh, uh, you couldn't leave Stuart Smith off the job uh, out the list, could you? You know, he he'd probably be top on it. Um, don't know, John Lund has to be in there, doesn't it? And uh, yeah. I I don't know, I don't know who the other one would be. Andrew Smith, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I think when you know, I think, when I've asked... I think I'd be well down the list. Do you reckon? Yeah, I Where do you reckon you'd come in at? Do you think, oh. uh, if it, if it, <laughs> Probably last. No, no, I reckon nine. I reckon, I reckon you get number nine easy. <laughs> I reckon. As long as it's not number seven, I'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I avoided that number, that's good. <laughs> we both think it's safe. Okay, um, and, and my final question for you. So there is light at the end of the tunnel, um, but as yet, there are still no plans for any brisker racing. If we are to get back racing this year, and I guess following the announcement in the week that there's going to be no World Finals, what, what do you think that should look like specifically for Brisket Formula 1? Um, difficult one to answer, as, you know, obviously being a promoter, you want the cars to come and everything. I, safe is the only thing I could say. You know, you want people to come back safely, don't you? Yeah. That's, that's you know, and as, as that is at the minute... I'm not sure how that will look, but that's that's top of the list. There has to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a real desire to get back racing, Earth, but I think obviously everybody is aware. Actually, we, we can do it, but we we need to do it in a in a safe way. And I think you know the announcement of no world finals is right and was I guess expected. We aren't we are How can you do a world final? Um, but whether we can have something at the back end of the year is is I think people are kind of hoping for that. I suppose just to get if, something in this year. If it's uh, if we can get it back safely. I think it should just come back with uh, just fun. No, nothing too serious. Just, you know, more for fun because people have had such a you know bad year. I think it, just enjoying it would be the, the right thing to do. OK, lovely. Rob, it's been brilliant talking to you tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Before we go, is there anything you'd like to add, say, before you kind of say goodbye and get back to doing whatever you're doing at Skate Nest Stadium? <laughs> No, I just hope everybody's safe and, you know, everyone's fine. You know, that's the main thing. And, you know, if we come back later this year or if we come back next year, as long as everyone comes back safe, that's the main thing. Brilliant. Rob, thank you so much for your time tonight, like I say, and um, hopefully we'll see you at Shakespeare Stadium very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.